Pisava Church. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. Reminded us through the Sabbath school lesson how important is your second coming. And we pray the Lord as we wait for that day that you prepare each one of us. As we continue on in learning from your scripture, we pray that your presence will be in our midst so that each one of us are prepared for that day. We ask all this in your name. Amen. All right. Um, this morning, I'm bringing you a title on a mission. I've been uh, thinking about a sermon which really uh, I've been preaching for a while. Um, I'm very grateful that the opportunity has given and I would like to share this to each one of you. For this morning, I would like to begin with this story. Many, many years ago in about 1952, there was this lady by the name of Florence Chadwick. Maybe some of you have heard of her, that she's actually a female long distance swimmer. She can swim for hours and hours. One of her older record before this 1952, she had, she swim uh, for 13 hours and 20 minutes. You know, she's a really long distance swimmer. I don't think, uh, I'm, I'm not putting down on you, but at least myself, I can't swim very long, even in a swimming pool. My kids wanting to stay longer, but about 20 minutes, I think I'm quite tired and enough. But anyway, so Florence, uh, on 1952, on July, it was actually quite cold in, um, in California. So what happened, she has this vision of swimming from the coast, uh, towards the coast. And this is the uh, water of Pacific Ocean. It was quite cold, chill at that morning. So this young woman, Florence, so she started to swim. Of course, there is this coach or whoever that is behind her. Uh, if anything happened, they will rescue her. So what happened? The first hour she was swimming, the second hour, and she continued to swim and swim. Of course, sometimes uh, she feel a bit uh, numb, but she still continued on swimming. There was the time also that it says that, according to the report, that there's a shark coming close to her as she managed to, to, to survive from that. And she continued on swimming, swimming. But unfortunately, after 15 hours before she reached the destination, she quit. She quit. And they found out she was actually not far from her destination. And they wondered, the coach asked her, why do you quit? You're almost there. You're almost there. Is it because of tired? Are you frustrated? Do you have numb anywhere? Is it because it's too cold? And this is what she said. I'm not excusing myself. But if I could have seen the land, I repeat, if she could have seen the land, she would have made it. And she said it wasn't because of the call of fear of exhaustion. It was the fog. It was so cold, the fog, the mist was blocking her view from seeing the land and she quit. She didn't know what is, where, where is the direction and she didn't know how long again. And she has been swimming for 15 hours and she quit. It says that she only left 1.6 km. 1.6 km. For over 42 km that she, about 42 km that she already finished, only left 1.6 and she quit. Brother and sister, how about us in our spiritual journey? I hope we don't quit. I hope we don't quit. During our discussion in our Sabbath school, our dear teacher asked as, she con as he concluded the lesson, how about us as Adventists? You know, do we know what we believe? Are we waiting for Christ? Could it be at the very beginning of a baptism? You see the water, if you can see, Chinese group is having baptism later on. As we got baptized, perhaps we dearly love Jesus. But how about our spiritual journey in our middle of our path, our journey? Have we given up? Have we feel very exhausted? Are we so tired of the challenges, the temptations, you know, that we receive front and back? Do we feel persecuted? Many times, 
we fail not because we are afraid of peer pressure. It was not because of all those, but because of anything other than the fact that we sometimes lost sight of the goal. We could be working in Adventist hospital, but we do not know what do we believe. We could be growing up in Adventist church, but we don't even know the significant message that we embrace. And in this future journey, could it be that we are, as we travel, travel at the end, probably in the midst of our traveling, we're wondering, where are we actually heading? What are we actually waiting? Are we really waiting for Christ to come? Proverbs 29, uh, the, the verse that has been read, without vision, the people perish. I remember when I was young, uh, that was during a raining season or so, like almost like now. It was around my, uh, I think it's my, high, uh, my primary school. Suddenly we have this idea of, uh, because, you know, in Kampung, all the water clog up, you know, and it's very muddy, but that is our swimming pool, I remember. So what happened, I told my brother, I said, come on, let's have a project. So you know what we did? We go and chop the bamboo and we want to make a, in our language we call racket lah. I'm not sure in, in English, I just say boat, huh? probably it's not really accurate. So we want to make a boat, we spent days. I remember come back from school and it was raining, we were so happy, we said, this project is going to work, we are going to make it. And you know, we chop bamboo, it hurts our fingers, you know, me and my brother, we really into this project. To cut the long story short, we did not manage to finish it. I'm not sure whether we were persecuted by parents or something. But somehow, we did not manage to finish the project. Now, what we're we talking about today is not an ordinary vision that we have or a childhood dream. It was not about that. When the Bible mentioned vision over here, the Bible talks of visions that come from God. It is God thing. You know, it has to do finding out what God is up in, in, out in, for us in this world and joining Him in doing it. And vision in the Hebrew word, it means divine revelation. It's something from divine. It's not like an idea just pop up suddenly like, oh, I need to eat McDonald's this afternoon. It's not that. So this vision is a divine revelation. It's a direction, an insight from God to us. It's a mission that we need to fulfill in life. Without God showing us, we are bound to perish. And we all are living, achieving this. The new standard version uh, New Standard Revised Version and RSV say, where there is no prophecy, the people cast off restraint. Vision and prophecy, when you look at the translation, is more or less the same. But how about let's go to the next verse. In 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 9, I, I, this verse is interesting. It says, formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquires of God, when a man comes to God, he spoke thus, come, let us go to what? To where? To a seer. Because the Bible says, for he who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. So a prophet synonym to a seer. So when they need to know what God wants to tell them, they will go to a prophet, to a seer. Interesting. For those of you that have Chinese blood, probably you know a little bit of Mandarin, right? At least you know Kung Si Fa Chai, right? Or at least you know how to write your name. Prophet in Chinese is xian zi. I like this, xian zi. When you directly translate it, it means they first known it. They know it first, then they tell you. It's something that they see, something revealed to them, then they tell you, God say so. They xian zi dao. So when you talk about prophets, they have the first hand a message that they will tell people who comes to them wanting, inquiring from them what God said of certain thing. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1 and 2, I will stand. Habakkuk said, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I'm corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain on tablets that he may run who reads it. So what Habakkuk is basically saying he is a prophet and when God tells him, God asks him, when telling him something, he needs to write it. So when people can read. Now you see in the ancient time, people always come to prophets 
they come to seer because seer are connected to God and they see what God sees. The Israelites, they was brought by Moses out. Moses is a figure of God. It's like, it's like representing God, leading them out. Unfortunately, it comes to Exodus 32, Moses went to Sinai to get the tablet, Ten Commandments. What happened? Chapter 32, verse 1. Now, when the people saw that Moses delay coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, Come, make us gods that shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So what do they decide? Because Moses was not in sight and they have questions, they have doubt whether Moses survived or not. They don't see him. They don't see the seers. They don't see the prophet. They don't see the representative, God representative. What do they want? They began to have spiritual doubtery. Now when we see here, the Israelites do not see the leader, therefore they lose their vision. They lose the direction. I would say they lose their faith. Could it be that in our spiritual walk, when we lose sight of our leader, of, of, of Jesus, of the scriptures, his word, we perish. The people turn away from the visions. They have carried them across the Red Sea towards the promised land. They are supposed to head into the promised land. But what happened? They shrug off the laws and guidelines God has given them. They persuaded Aaron to make golden calf. And when Moses came back down, things were in terrible mess. They have cast off every restraint. Not only that, throughout the journey, if you read from Exodus uh, from the beginning, how they came out and come to 32, you know that they, they are really messed up. There are people, a bunch of people that never learn. And what happened? We know they end up wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Scholars believe if they would have been following everything, probably in two weeks or a month, they will reach the promised land. They would have reached the promised land. They don't have to spend 40 years going round and round. Imagine millions of people protesting no water. Imagine millions of people you know, they're facing war and they're having problems here and there. Now, let's look at the patriarchs and uh, prophets, uh, page 406 and 407. It mentions here, for nearly 40 years, the children of Israel are lost to view in the obscurity of the desert. The challenges of the desert, the reality that they're in the desert, that have stopped them, blinded them to move forward. The wilderness wandering was not only ordained as a judgment upon the rebels and murmurers, but it was to serve as a discipline for the rising generation, preparatory to their entrance into promised land. In other words, God sees them. They has to go through the wilderness experience in order for them to prepare for promised land. Dear brother and sister, there are many things happen in life we could understand. You know, in our spiritual journey, it might be tough for you. You might have persecutions that nobody has and nobody could understand in the church. Or you have temptations that is so unique that probably only, only dedicated for you. You know, the four facts about the wilderness that, can, that could apply to each and one of us that I found interesting is the wildernesses, wilderness or wildernesses are prepared, are place of need. We all need that. And God sees that this place is the prerequisite before heaven. Wildernesses are places of dependence. It is in wilderness that we learn to depend on our Lord. The third one, wilderness are places of what? Learning. There are many characters in the scriptures They spend their life some part of their life in wilderness. Moses spent time in the wilderness. Um, John the Baptist, the Israelites, uh, um, did I mention Moses? Yes, Moses, Jeremiah, and many, many other. Even the church in Revelation said they went into the wilderness. 
They go to, we all have this wilderness experience because it is not only a place of need, it is a place where we learn, where we learn to depend also on God. But meanwhile, the last part, wilderness experience are never the final destination. It is just a transit. A few weeks ago, we went back to Sabah uh, for, for, for work purpose. Transit really caused some problem to Mr. Stephen. He lost his back because of transit. You now, could it be that sometimes in wilderness, we lost something? The scariest part is we lost our vision. We lost our faith. We lost our salvation. Dear brother and sister, Let's continue to dive into this word wilderness or desert. The word desert in Hebrew, just not to brag, I did learn a little bit of Hebrew words when in college. The word desert or midbar is actually coming from these uh, four words. You know, in, in Hebrew, they don't have all these vowel. So they're adding, sometimes uh, you will learn that there is no vowel. You're just adding with those uh, 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 a short sign so you will see this it says m d and b and r right it's actually mem dalet bev and resh so these four words when you combine them it it is the the root word of desert and because there is no vowel and this is how you actually pronounce it okay midbar you use those dots and two dots and uh, like a t so midbar but the same root word is also for speak it's also the same root word. It's just that the imbuhan, the, the dot, dot, the sign is not there. But it's the same root word. It's also mem, dalet, bed, and resh. Now when you look at here, could it be that the desert is a place where you hear God speaks? Clearly. Before Jesus started his ministry, his three years ministry, three and a half, he went to the wilderness right after his baptism. He had the experience of learning. He had, it's, it's, a, it's a place of need. It's a place of need where he learned to hear from God. Dear brother and sister, the Bible mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17, all scriptures is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. So God has given us the scriptures until now. It is then that we experience God. We hear God's word as he speaks to us. I believe, strongly believe, it is during our toughest time in the wilderness experience that the more we are challenged, the more difficulties that come to us, the more we need the scripture. Amen? Jeremiah chapter 6, you see another uh, symbols, another way of putting it again. In Jeremiah chapter 6, looking at verse 16 to 19, thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see, asking Jeremiah, and ask for the old path where the good way is and walk in it, and then you will find rest for your soul. But they say, we will not walk in it. Also I said, watchmen over you, saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they say, we will not listen. Verse 18. Therefore hear ye nations and know all generations. What is among them? Hear, O earth. Behold, I will certainly bring calamities on these people. The fruit of their thoughts, because they have not heeded my words, nor my law, but rejected it. In the day of Jeremiah, his ministry is towards the people of Israel. What happened? They were in deep spiritual weakness. They have backslided. They have committed uh, adultery spiritually. So God has sent Jeremiah to speak to them. What did they do? They don't want to listen. And Jeremiah said, listen, go back to the old path, things that you have learned before. You know, sometimes when we talk about this, we are all like a travelers. We are all on this journey and we all make choice. The first thing we can learn from the scripture, he says, we need to ask the old path. We need to find out what is the old path. We need to find out what is the truth. I'm not Penang Nights. Sometimes I drive. Even to my third year here, I still need to depend on the ways. Sometimes the ways show me this is the right way. 
And I told myself to the ways, I don't trust you. You know what I did? I end up, I thought I'm having a shortcut, a longer cut. I don't know cut what. But it's too long. And my wife said, you could have just listen, but the ego is there. And I was like, no, nobody needs to teach me, not even my device. Could it be in our spiritual journey, sometimes we think we know better? Jesus said, I am the way. We say, no, 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 not only you. I also know the way. Interesting. Second point, we must follow. We must follow the old path. This is the only way. You know, sometimes we call it old because we probably think this is ancient. Even there's a song, ancient words. It's ancient. We are in new generation. You know, we are very secular right now. We don't need the old book to teach us. We don't need all the old counsels. This is a new way in dating. New style. New way to behave. New way of worship. Worst thing, new way to praise God. Dear brother and sister, the problem of Israelites face is a problem people face down throughout the ages. They get the wrong direction and they follow them. And many times those new directions it's not vision from God. It's the own personal vision. Or vision from Satan. Matthew chapter 7 verse 13, Jesus says, Broad is the way that leads to where? Destruction. The problem is many who go in through this broad way. Broad. Big. But the narrow path, only little. Only little. Proverbs 14 verse 12, There is a way that seems right to a man, but at the end is the way of death. Many people fail to see what God wants them to see. And they keep walking, keep walking, keep walking further and further from the old path. And they have lost eternity. John 14 verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. There's no other way. The consequences for those who refuse to hear, to refuse to, to take God's counsel, this is what happened. You know, God promised to those of us who walk in His path is that we will find rest of our soul. However, those who fail to ask the old path will find themselves walking in the way of destruction and misery. Misery. When we turn our backs on the way God has chosen, as the right way, we will find that there, that way is not bringing us to heaven. It's not bringing us to heaven. Our text tells us uh, earlier that we read that those who not walk in the Lord's will or in the Lord's path, the result is destruction. They will perish. God is clear. You know, even uh, even Paul mentioned in Philippians, he says that in chapter 3 verse 14, he says what? I press toward the mark for the price of the high calling or heavenly calling of God, Jesus Christ. He was keep looking at Christ and he keep walking. In this journey, it reminds me of a vision of Ellen White. This is not earthly vision. This is a vision came from God. I like this reading. It, it found, you, can, you can read the entire vision. Can found in Life Sketches, page 30. She says that the road was a narrow one. And a lot actually walk on this narrow path. And this, Laurel, this path is leading towards heavenly, upward. And as you see, people bringing a lot of stuff. And along this road, they have to let go. To the extent, they let go their cargo, they let go their stuff, their baggages. And what happened? They even have to Take off the shoe. Walk on tiptoe because it was so narrow. One side is precipice and the other side is a wall, white wall. And throughout the white wall, throughout the journey, they see stains of blood. And in front of her, because how do I know? Because of the end of the journey, they reach an, an, an end. In front of her was her husband, James White. And they saw a big rope that coming down from Atas. And nobody don't know what to do. And everyone say, oh, maybe, salah jalan. Haka say, holana. <laughs> Going to nowhere. It's a dead end. 
And James hold tight on the big rope and he swing across to the other side. And when, he, when Ellen White saw that, she also followed. And that is her destination. That is where Jesus is. That is heaven. Now, you know what's what interesting about this narrow path? Along the road, a lot of people gave up. A lot. Some fell. Some U-turned. Brother and sister, in this journey, it calls narrow path. It is not, it's all already told by Christ that it is not a journey that's easy. In a special sense, seven Adventists have been set in the world as a watchman. We are like Jeremiah, tell people, this is the old path, come. And we are the watchmen and the light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning to a perishing world. There is no other work is so great importance. They are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. Our focus should be heavenly. Our focus should be heaven. The advent of Christ's second coming. Dear brother and sister, there's no other work is more important than this. You may be a doctor, you may be a nurse, you may be still studying, but still our mission and vision is heavenward. God may place you with certain ministry, but that is what God entrusted to you and you have to perform it. Let me go back to Florence. After two months, she returned back. And she finished. She finished. What makes her finish? It's still cold. F fog was everywhere. Because she has the picture, the vision that if she continue on pursue going this, that direction, she will reach the land. Brother and sister, amen? If we continue on, be faithful, we continue to hold on what we believe. Just as the beginning of our journey where we get baptized, we say, Jesus, I love you. I want to be true to you. I want to have devotion every morning. If we stay on with our commitment, I tell you, we will make to the other side. If we have the trust in Jesus, as Jesus is our guide, the only way, even though no matter how, how narrow was it, I, I forget to tell you, it was the same rope that, that they actually hold on when it was so tight. As the journey gets tougher, the road gets bigger. I cannot imagine this because it is not something you can see. The road gets bigger and their faith trusting on that rope in our journey. Our faith, Romans says, faith come by hearing, hearing from the word of God. John chapter 9, as I end my last slide. Jesus said, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. Dear brother and sister, now is the time that we should be faithful. We are on a mission. We are, God has given us, everybody have our different vision. Okay, my vision might not be the same, but our mission is to save souls. Our mission is to be faithful. Our mission is to reach to the other side. As we're hearing from the group, as they were rendering us our last song, uh, I mean the closing song speak about everything that we do in our daily life it is a ministry it is a sacrifice for the Lord and I pray that each one of us will be faithful until Jesus comes